The EPA defines recovery as taking refrigerant out of the system in any condition and storing it into a recovery tank. Before we get to the process of recovery, we need to understand a lot of the information that's involved in these tanks. To get started with, recovery tank. This is a recovery tank. It's got a gray body with a yellow top. It's also easy to identify because we have these two different knobs, these two different ports at the top. And these two ports are the things that the students, new students, get confused with the most. So let's start there and get that cleared up first. Here we have two different valves, and all these valves really means is one has a straw that goes to the bottom of the tank, and the other one has a hole at the very top of the tank. I've cut this one open so you can see the operation, and here this valve on this side has a straw going all the way to the bottom. The other valve has a hole right here at the very, very top. So in its upright form, the valve that's written on it, liquid, has a straw going all the way to the very top. The vapor pressure pushes down on that liquid refrigerant, and if you were to open this valve, liquid refrigerant shoot out because the vapor pressure pushing down on the liquid would push the liquid up through the straw and liquid refrigerant would be coming out. If I was to open up the vapor port, since it's at the very top, only vapor pressure would be coming out through this port. That's the only difference in it. But it's important to read if it says liquid or vapor. And in the upright position, liquid has a straw to the bottom and gas or the vapor one has only a hole at the very top. So the question is, if I wanted to take liquid refrigerant out of this tank, I could leave it upright and open the liquid port. And the liquid would be coming through the straw from the bottom out of the tank. Just like you would if you had a drink and you're sucking through a straw and you're getting the liquid coming out of that drink. On the vapor side, we're only getting the vapor coming out. But could you get vapor out of the gas side? Absolutely. If we took this tank and we turned it upside down and I opened the vapor port, what would be coming out? It's exactly right. We'd have liquid refrigerant coming out. So if we think about it only simply being on the upright position, the one that says liquid has a straw to the bottom and the one that says vapor does not. That's the only difference in them. I can get liquid out of either port depending on how I turn this. Now another very important factor and a lot of the new students make this mistake, even seasoned technicians will make this mistake, is the color of these knobs do not matter. There's no industry standard for these and different manufacturers use different colors. Let me clarify, this valve right here says liquid on it. It's red in color and has a straw going to the bottom. This valve also says liquid on it. It has a straw going to the bottom, but this one's using blue for liquid and this one's using red for liquid. If we look on the other side, this one says vapor. Vapor has the hole at the very top and it's using blue. This one says gas or vapor at the top, but it's using red. Simply that the one that says liquid has a straw, the one that says vapor has the hole at the very top. So don't get hung up on exactly what it means. If you understand the straw versus no straw, it doesn't matter. So if really, if you wanted to get liquid refrigerant out, you could use the vapor port, turn it upside down and you're getting the exact same thing. These tanks are also built a lot heavier. They're built a lot thicker. Because we're reusing these tanks over and over again, these tanks are built to handle that extra abuse. Thicker metal so they don't rupture nearly as easy. We also know that these tanks don't have any kind of a check valve built into them. By not having that check valve, it allows us to put refrigerant into the tank or take refrigerant out of this tank. So that's an important concept. Now if we also look at these tanks, there's another important number on there. If we look on the side, there's gonna be a DOT number. We talked about DOT with the disposable tanks. We cannot reuse them. Well, these tanks have a DOT number as well. This tank says DOT 4BA350. And if I look on this tank, it says DOT 4BA400. This one says 350 and this one says 400. What's the difference between a 350 and a 400? and simply the amount of pressure that can handle. A 400 tank can handle the pressure of 410A refrigerant. A 350 tank can only handle lower pressure refrigerant, such as R22. I could not put 410A refrigerant into this tank because it's not built to handle it. This tank, a lot of times they'll put high pressure just to make it simple, HP on the tank, but when I get this tank, I could put R22 in here or 410A refrigerant here. It can handle either one. Now when I say it can handle either one, it can handle either one 
individually. We cannot mix the refrigerants. So when I get this tank and I'm gonna put 410A refrigerant in it and there's no other refrigerant in there, I would label or mark on this tank 410A. So that way I knew what refrigerant's in here. If I have this tank and I'm putting R22 in it, then I'm gonna write in this tank R22 refrigerant. That way I don't accidentally get mixed up and put the wrong refrigerant into these tanks. It's very important that you label the tank so that you know what's in there. It saves you a whole lot of time and if we mix refrigerants, if I put R22 and 410A in this tank, I would now have a mixed refrigerant. When I take this back to be reclaimed, they would have to incinerate or destroy the refrigerant because they don't have any way of separating that. And that's gonna be very expensive, very costly to your company. So we wanna make sure that we only put one refrigerant and one refrigerant alone in there. Now, the next thing is if you start working for another company or you take over somebody's service van, they're gonna have tanks. And it's most likely that at some point in time, you're gonna find somebody that did not label these tanks. So if you have a tank of refrigerant, for example, there's refrigerant in this tank right now. This one just so happens to be empty, I don't know why. And then there's some other kind of refrigerant into this tank right now. How do we know what refrigerants are in these tanks? Well, if they did not label it, we have a very simple solution. What I'm gonna do, I'm gonna take my pressure gauge and I'm gonna find the one that says vapor because I just wanna know the pressure in the tank. And I'm gonna hook my pressure gauge up to the one that says vapor refrigerant turn my gauge on and I'm going to open this up. The next thing we need is a thermometer. And I'm gonna put a thermometer on the tank, not just anywhere on the tank. I wanna put the thermometer down low where it's gonna be liquid refrigerant. It's important I get it to where the liquid's located. In this case, I'm gonna put the thermometer down low, like right, right down here, right by this bend. And it's also important that you don't hold it with your finger because your finger's gonna change the temperature of that thermometer. So usually I use a little piece of tape and I just tape my thermometer right there in the bottom. I use a digital thermometer and I give it a little bit of time so it equalizes. Now, if you just moved your tank from one room to another, that's all out the window. You need to give it time for it to equalize in temperature. So now I know the temperature and the pressure of this tank. I'm gonna use my temperature and pressure app. So here we go, I'm gonna open my app up. And the first thing I'm just gonna guess and pick a refrigerant. So I'm gonna pick R22. So R22 refrigerant, and I'm gonna go to my PT calculator, and I'm just gonna enter in what my liquid pressure is. So I know in this tank, my pressure is 136 PSI gauge. That tells me my temperature to be at 76.7. I look at my thermometer and the temperature of this tank shows right at 76 degrees Fahrenheit. So I know for sure there is R22 refrigerant in this tank. I've checked the temperature and the pressure in that tank and it matches my temperature and pressure chart. So we know it's pure clean refrigerant. Now, if I had mixed refrigerant and I knew the pressure and I knew my temperature and it didn't match what my temperature pressure app said, then there'd be a very high chance that I had a mixed refrigerant or it was some other refrigerant. Let's check this tank. So I'm gonna close this one off. I'm gonna put it on the vapor side, thread it on, open this tank up, and it gives me a new vapor pressure. Let's just assume that it was R22. So I get my temperature pressure app. I'm gonna set it for R22. And I'm gonna put in here my pressure. This is 211.5. And it tells me my temperature to be 105.1. Well, I know that my temperature is not 105.1. It should be 76. So that tells me that this is not R22 refrigerant. So let's pick another refrigerant. We'll pick refrigerant 410A. So with 410A, it says that my temperature should be at 72.9. And my temperature is at 76 degrees. So we know that this may be 410A and it may be fractionated or it may be mixed with something else or another type of refrigerant. So I want to continuously go through these refrigerants until I find out what refrigerant's in this tank or have it tested because it may just simply be a contaminated tank refrigerant. It's so much simpler if we just simply labeled it. Had we labeled this tank R4 today, we would simply know. But good thing is this tank was labeled. We wrote on here R4 today. So we know that there's only R4 today refrigerant in this tank, but it doesn't match my temperature pressure app. So what does that tell you? There's some contamination in this tank. There's some other kind of impurities, maybe some other refrigerant, maybe some fractionation. We don't know, but it's not a pure clean mixture anymore. So this refrigerant definitely needs to be sent away and sent off. That's a quick way to know what refrigerant's in there. Now when we get to high blend refrigerants like 407C, now it gets a little bit trickier. We have to use the median temperature and sometimes that can be a little bit off. So we wanna make sure we check with the manufacturer and follow their rules for finding the purity of that refrigerant. So more important things, when we're transporting these tanks, we wanna make sure that they're secure. These tanks are gonna be a lot heavier than our one-time use tanks. So when these tanks start flopping around in your service van, they can cause a lot more damage. They can break other sensitive equipment, such as your meters, but that valve can also be knocked loose. If this valve right here gets knocked loose, it's spraying refrigerant, leaking refrigerant 
refrigerant out into your service fan. Now you're driving your service fan and there's refrigerant leaking out and that refrigerant will displace oxygen. And even if you're using a non-toxic refrigerant, that refrigerant displacing oxygen can cause you to pass out. You're breathing in this refrigerant, you're passing out. So if you hear your refrigerant tank or anything in the back start to hiss, immediately get pulled over, get the windows down, get out of the van, open up the doors and find out what is it's leaking for your safety. So keeping that secure is very important. I've too many times seen people that throw that tank into the van. This tank had an issue. I was in a hurry to get done with the job. It was late at nine. I put the tank in the service van and I did not secure it. And sure enough, somebody comes out, pull out in front of me, hit the brake, swerve, did not hit them. The tank come out from its spot, hits the sidewall, and luckily it didn't break anything except on the tank itself, it caused a crack right here on the weld where the weld connects it to the handle. So something as simple as that one time not securing it can be an issue. Also, when you transport these tanks, they need to be in an upright or mostly upright position. A lot of the vans will have tank racks and they'll have it to where it holds the tank at an angle. You wanna make sure that the valve is in the upright position as most as possible. On the very back side of these tanks, there's gonna be a little pop-off valve built in. It's a little different than the one we had in the one-time use tanks. These are built a lot heavier duty, but it's right here in the back of this valve. So that if this tank leaks, the refrigerant is gonna leak out there instead of exploding the tank, if we get an overpressure situation. And if that happens, we want vapor only coming out. We don't want liquid coming out. So we transported this tank in the upside down position and there was to be a rupture and that liquid refrigerator to be coming out, this would be more of a propellant and it could be shooting that tank around. So we want to make sure it's in the upright position while we're in transport. So talking about transport and transporting this refrigerant, it's also gonna have that DOT number. We talked about the pressure, but also having the cylinder inspected. When they manufacture these cylinders, they're tested from the factory. In other words, we call a hydrostatic test, where they pressure test these to make sure that metal's in good shape and it's not going to leak and rupture and be safe for you to use. But that test is only good for five years. So the tank should be rechecked every five years and every five years after that and every five years after that. The good news is if you keep a tank in rotation, you don't have to worry about it. So if you keep a tank for too long, it'll get past the hydrostatic test point and then you have to pay to have it tested. For me, instead of paying to have this tank retested, I simply cut it open to make a good training video from it. But every five years, they'll put a stamp on it. So if you look somewhere on these tanks, there'll be a lot of little numbers stamped on here and those numbers are the test and inspection dates where they retest these tanks to make sure they're safe for you to use. Let's talk about rotation, what it means to me. I have this tank and it's up to 80% full, no fuller, and it's only one refrigerant. So I take it to the supply house where I get all my parts and they're gonna test the purity to make Make sure it's a pure refrigerant. Then they're gonna write me a receipt for it and they're going to exchange it. In other words, they're gonna keep this tank and its contents and they give me another tank. And this new tank is gonna be pulled out into a vacuum, pure clean tank with no labels on it. Then whatever refrigerant I put in there, I'm gonna then label it and keep track of it. So I just keep rotating these tanks back to the supply house. Now on the supply house side, they do something different. They take these tanks and they ship it back to the manufacturer where they have a reclaim factory. And they reclaim, they take all this refrigerant, they refilter it and bring it back to HRI standards of new refrigerant. They put it into a one-time use only tank and send it back to supply house to be resold. They then take these empty tanks and they have them reinspected, retested, and they send them back to supply house so that they can keep it rotation. So if you keep a tank in constant rotation, you shouldn't have to worry too much about that inspection date. But if you keep a tank too long, it could be an issue. That's how we simply work with these tanks. We take them back to supply house where we get them. There's a lot to take in there. Get your chance to look at these, make some notes on it, understanding temperature pressure relationship, the DOT pressure, the color of the tank, the valves, and what that straw means. But hang on, we still have a whole lot more to discuss.